Good afternoon or good morning, as the case may be, everybody. Thank you all for joining the webinar. I'm Dave Harmon, uh, Executive Director at George Wright Society, and we're happy to host the webinar today. Uh, if you turn on your chat, you'll see a few messages from me in there about uh, things like uh, the fact that we're recording the webinar and so forth. And the main thing I want to say before I turn it over to our moderator is that you will be able to enter questions into the chat at any time, and I'll be monitoring that and helping feed them to uh, our moderator and, of course, our, our main speaker. So I'm going to now turn it over to the moderator, uh, a longtime uh, you know, stalwart, really, of the George Wright Society, Rolf Diamant. Uh, and uh, Rolf, I'll let you introduce yourself briefly and then go ahead and introduce uh, Jerry, if you would. So take it away. Well, I'm not going to say very much about myself other than uh, I'm a big fan of Jerry's. Um, and uh, always had a keen interest in George Wright. Um, but this uh, is a, a huge, uh, long-awaited accomplishment, this book. And um, I'm very excited to introduce Jerry today. Um, Jerry's a highly accomplished environmental author and uh, conservationist. Uh, for most of his professional career, he's worked as a writer and a, and a communications consultant for a variety of organizations, including the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, uh, the California State Parks Foundation, and uh, the Save the Redwoods League. Uh, he's a graduate of both UC Berkeley and Stanford, uh, really spanning the Bay Area. Um, and uh, Jerry's has written dozens of magazine articles on the environment, conservation, and science with a focus on Latin America and the uh, Western United States. In addition to his newly published George Melendez Wright biography, he's the author of five books, including the San Francisco Bay Shoreline Guide and the Monterey Bay Shoreline Guide. He has twice, not once, but twice served on the board of the George Wright Society. Um, I cannot refrain uh, from just sharing my opinion that this is the best and most important book about the early development of the US National Park Service since Richard West Sellers came out with Preserving Nature in the National Parks. This is a landmark book. Um, George Melendez Wright, The Fight for Wilderness, Wildlife and Wilderness in the National Parks is published by the University of Chicago Press. And I would urge all of you, uh, if you haven't already, you can, uh, uh, working through the George Wright Society, uh, through their webpage, you can in fact uh, purchase this book through the publisher's website at a 30% discount. I'm sure Dave will fill in uh, the details of this. Uh, a bit later or posted in the chat. Well, to start, Jerry, uh, can you tell us something about who George Melendez Wright was and why you chose to write this book? First of all, Raul, thank you very much for moderating and also including my name and the, name, the same sentence with uh, Dick Sellers, quite, quite an honor. <laughs> um, the reason why is actually pretty pretty basic and simple, and that is because when I was in graduate school at Berkeley, um, I was in a PhD program in, in geography. Um, um, I met and fell in love with one of George Wright's granddaughters, and uh, we're still married. She's upstairs, uh, well, pushing, pushing 40 years, but you know, 37, something like that. I don't know, I don't quite remember. And that's how I met George Wright, was actually through my girlfriend, that eventual wife. Although I'd always had an interest, I was a lifelong birder and conservationist. And and um, and so that's how I learned about his short um, but incredibly productive life. And I think that's really the key to one of the key things about Wright is that, you know, he, he died tragically when he was 31. Um, but had already produced, um, had already written and had done um, as much as someone, you know, twice his age. Uh, he had published an, an awful lot of things, including his seminal 
fauna, which I happen to have right here, which we can talk about later. Um, and he was just, a, he had a very unique upbringing um, and was raised by um, his great aunt who was, uh, you know, born in 1840 um, and adopted by her when he was a young teen after all sorts of family tragedy. And she raised him uh, and, and just let him explore San Francisco untethered uh, into the wilds. There, there was wilds in San Francisco back then. He was born in 1904. And uh, he just did a lot of exploring. His, his entry into the natural world was birds. Um, and um, he just became um, singularly focused on wildlife and the national parks as he, as, he, uh, as he matured and actually got out and visited the parks you know, early on. Yeah, Jerry, given your uh, entree to the right family, um, you know, you're obviously in an unusual position to access information and uh, archival material. Uh, but can you talk for a bit about all the sources that you tapped in order to write your book? You bet. Um, so when I first met my, my mother-in-law, Pamela Melendez Wright Lloyd, who, who's still with us and going to be turning 90 in October. Um, years and years ago, she, she showed me a box filled with three um, field note books. And um, because I'd gone to Berkeley and taken a zoology class there, I realized that what she had were George Wright's original field notes from the wildlife survey he created. Um, and between 1930 and 1933. And that was just the beginning of, uh, of, of researching some of the documents the family had kept. Um, when he passed away, his wife actually kept pretty much everything he had um, as much as she could. And so, and kept his memory alive even though, even though she remarried. And so there's that whole set of documents. Um, and then off and on over the years, because I've been thinking about this book literally for you know, 35 years, um, I did would do a little bit of research here and there. And um, at uh, I hired some consultants, some his, some retired historians that have access to different archives around the US, um, Denver Library, Harper's Ferry, National Archives uh, Central. Um, and then just before COVID hit, um, luckily, I spent an uh, incredibly productive week in the National Archives in San Bruno. They're called the San Francisco uh, Archives, but I'm just north of San Francisco. <clears throat> and they're down San Bruno, down the peninsula. And it was a, it was a gold mine. It was just incredible because the Wildlife Department and um, the Early Park Service, they had an office in San Francisco, but a lot of it was based out of Berkeley. So any thought, anytime anything was written, it was done in triplicate. And um, one was copy was sent to DC. One was put in the San Francisco office, and and then they kept one in their own office. And so um, the correspondence is it's all behind me in these in these folders. I took copies of everything um, and uh, organized them as they were organized in the archives, so that I could reference them uh, properly. And that really helped fill out the picture of what was going on within the Park Service during his time but also personal relationships um, and issues to be resolved because this was the time of letters. Uh, people didn't get on the phone and call between San Francisco and DC all the time. Um, they actually had a kind of a hard time meeting in, in person sometimes, and um, which is reflected in the correspondence. So you get a lot of long memos, um, notes in the margins. Um, and then I did some interviews. I, I happened to, um, interview Ben Thompson, who was George Wright's best friend and uh, thought partner um, during the uh, late 20s and, and 30s, uh, when he was in his 80s in New Mexico, where he had retired with his wife. And I recorded a couple of conversations with him over a couple of day period, which was just phenomenal because um, he was one of the only people that had actually worked with Wright that was still alive. And um, so that really gave a good personal picture of the person. 
and uh, filled it filled in some some information there also. You know, you, you're talking about and speaking about the relationships he had with people like Ben Thompson. It just springs to mind. It comes to <clears> mind <throat> how relationships really matter uh, and still do in the National Park Service today. Um, you know, it's not that big an organization. And Wright built a network of friends and colleagues that he uh, used that enabled him to be extraordinarily effective. Um, and people, people like Ben Thompson, but also people all over the service and outside the service and other agencies. Um, you, uh, you know, attribute much of his success to his kind of winning character, if you will. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about the importance of those relationships in not only in the advancement of his career, but in his ability to accomplish so much in such a short time? Sure. That, that is really, uh, I think, one of the keys to his success was his his personality and um, his ability to get along with a cross-section of people um, without creating, uh, without making uh, enemies. Um, you know, Ben Thompson, George Wright was half Salvadoran. His mother was Salvadoran, came from a very large family in El Salvador. On his father's side, they came from um, steamboat, uh, steamship captains after the gold rush. And his father was in an import export business, which is where I, we think he met his wife in El Salvador. But then they moved to San Francisco. He lost both of his parents really early. By the time he was 10, uh, his, he had two brothers, one, and they both went back to El Salvador and he was raised by this, who he called auntie. Um, and he was, he was schooled in all of the social norms of the day and, and loved parties and, and um, was very gregarious, I think, naturally. Um, but as, as Ben Thompson said, he was five feet, four inches with dark skin. And he just looked a little different. And if you think about what the service was at the time and has been until recent history, um, he was surrounded by um, a bunch of older Caucasian males. And so um, that was even a harder nut to crack for him uh, once he really got into the service and, and started really changing, trying to change some minds. Um, but his three mentors at Berkeley also, I think helped shape him professionally. He actually um, went to uh, graduate in forestry, even though he's known for his wildlife and zoology. So he's studying underneath Walter Mulford, as in Mulford Hall in Berkeley. He spent a lot of time, um, his main mentor was Joseph Grinnell in the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. And then Grinnell's right-hand man, Joseph Dixon, who was 20 years Wright's elder, really uh, became uh, dear friends with him, and he was also a mentor in the field, in terms of field work and how to get things done. Um, and all three of those men, um, believe it or not, were birthright more, uh, uh, Quakers. And even though they weren't practicing Quakers, the Quaker influence um, showed up in their in their character, the way they wanted to create um, community. Um, they weren't confrontational. They were all great teachers. Um, and they learned how to listen. Wright was a great listener. And for um, a young man, he entered Berkeley when he was 16. For a young man that didn't have a father and no father figures in his life, those three men, I think, had an oversized influence on him. And so he, he created community. He created a wildlife team, Ben Thompson and Joseph Dixon. And after he was able to convince uh, Director Albright to conduct this survey, which he paid for the first two years, I think another thing that's interesting is that they, when they went out and they observed what was going on in the parks and all the bad things and some good things, they would not stop someone if they were shooting a coyote. They wouldn't stop people if they were cutting down trees. They, the first couple of years, they were there to observe and take, and then come back to the director with their recommendations. So not confrontational, but they all had strongly held beliefs, which becomes crystal clear later on. Um, so he was, uh, he was a gregarious guy that was just blessed with an amazing character um, and personality. 
And uh, he was also just focused on the task at hand, which was wildlife in the national parks, even though they dealt with a whole series of, of issues around that in the parks and beyond the parks. And also his ability to work across, um, you know, being able to deal with the, the director and all the different superintendents all the way down to the backcountry rangers and the guys, you know, during the during the depression, the, the guys doing the work on the CCC crews um, also spilled over into eventually him being able to work with the Forest Service, which, you know, the National Park Service and the Forest Service, right? I mean, they didn't get along, uh, mostly because when you create a new national park, it usually comes from Forest Service land. Uh, and plus, they just had different philosophies about land management. Um, and then also eventually he was able to turn around the relationship with the US Biological Survey um, towards the very end of his life uh, in 35 and early 1936, uh, to the point where the, the director of the Biological Survey wrote the director of the Park Service, who at that time was Arno Kamer, saying, you know, we have a great relationship with your wildlife people. Um, we should continue it. If there's anything I can do for you, let me know. Um, and you know, quite remarkable from where it was just big, big turnaround six, six years before. Yeah, you spoke a, a bit, uh, before Jerry about the importance of the written word, um, at that point in time and the, um, the importance of, uh, staying in touch with people. Uh, it, it, reading this book, it strikes me that uh, Wright was just um, unbelievably effective in communications. He was a prolific writer, and he made sure that he that his team documented their work and that that was disseminated throughout the service, um, that it was reviewed, codified, and sent out. Um, and and not only that, I think it it really was striking how he valued the importance of this, both internal and external communications, because he was quite keen on building support for his wildlife program outside the service. He realized that he needed that support. So I, I was just wondering, um, you know, given the importance of being able to communicate, um, and really think back on the mission of the George Wright Society to encourage exchange of information among park, park and protected area professionals. Do you see that impulse of right continuing today in the society? Uh, and I just was wondering if you shared that uh, perspective. Well, of course, the society uh, you know, used to hold uh, conferences which was the natural meeting place for professionals within the park service and, and beyond to make presentations and hobnob and talk offline and you know you know officially and and all that and increasingly we're we're doing some of these webinars um but there's also uh the George Wright forum has morphed um as as hopefully everyone knows um, that's listening to the Park Stewardship Forum, which is a, a fantastic uh, online journal that um, you're very involved with, Rolf. And that's that's a spot um, where um, ideas are exchanged and and also um, um, you know developed. Um, but it's you know it's a very different time now than obviously when Wright was active. Um, and I oftentimes, you know, th think about that where the systems overload nowadays and too much information. Um, but, uh, I think the society is, is also uh, from the time I've been uh, observing it and involved in it has really expanded its, its, uh, viewpoint. Um, you know, it was started in 1980 by two of the top biologists in the park service at the time. Um, because they were looking around at the uh, need to bolster science within the Park Service to, to inform management, which is exactly what Wright was doing. 
and realized that what Wright was working on 50 years before, they were still working on. And they found inspiration in his writings and in Fauna 1 and 2. Um, and, uh, but of course, it's expanded into more uh, cultural resources and all sorts of other issues besides just straight up um, wildlife. So um, perhaps one day we'll get back to those conferences uh, within the society. Um, but this is a pretty good alternative, I think, you know, for now, uh, having uh, webinars and, and the society has put on um, a handful of very successful ones over the last, what, uh, two year, two years, maybe, or so? Dave, Dave Harmon will correct me later. Um, so I don't know if I really answered your question, but- uh, Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, getting also getting back to Wright's communication skills. He was, a, he was an excellent writer. Um, eloquent at times, poetic at times, both in his field notes and, and in his formal writing. Um, but he also was strategic. Um, for example, when he was he was he was fixated on the saving the trumpeter swans. And um, um, in fact, I was asked to mention that I just have a piece that came out in Audubon online um, on trumpeter swans, uh, George Wright and trumpeter swans last week, which you can look up online. Um, but at one point when he was trying to figure out how to save the trumpeter swans, above and beyond doing the basic biological field work, trying to figure out their life history, he realized he needed a communications campaign because he knew they were being shot outside of Yellowstone, which is where initially they thought was the only place they lived. And it was only a few pair to begin with. But they were also in Idaho and in Montana. And when he went around, he did a lot of interviewing of people out in the field during his, his research and old timers, locals, and they miss the swans and because they used to love seeing them come to the local lakes, but they'd all been shot out. And so he tried to use that sentiment and tried to and successfully. And he uh, incorporated local people into trying to push back against illegal hunting and they produce posters, and so we had this whole, he wrote out this memo to the director with this whole communication uh, scheme um, just for the trumpeter swan. And um, I, I honestly don't know where, where that came, but you know what he, uh, it didn't come from Dixon. Uh, I think Thompson probably helped him a little bit, but um, um, I, I don't know where the communication skills uh, came from because he also, another thing that happened was that there's a couple of different examples, but one thing they did when he produced Fauna One and, and radically changed, tried to change how the Park Service was uh, managing wildlife, there was a lot of pushback from the old time superintendents and old time head rangers. And so they did this thing where they, they sent Fauna One out to a cross section of academics and other professionals across the United States and asked for little blurbs back, little reviews. And then they, they put all those reviews into a single memo. It was like three pages. And then they sent that out to all the superintendents and head rangers and said, hey, look at this. And it was just a way, I mean, I don't know who thought about it, but it was a way to legitimize Fauna One and say that this is going to be adopted by the Park Service and you better follow those 20 points on the last page. Yeah, Stop it, was, it was a validation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, very clever, but also demonstrating um, that this wasn't just the team of three here speaking. Right. You quote in your book, um, George Wright, uh, George Mondes Wright is saying something to the effect that wilderness preservation is a form of use, not a withdrawal from use. And in the context of the National Park Service, which is a very people-oriented organization, in, in building support for wilderness, how is that expression in that this is not a withdrawal from use, but a different form of use? How is that, um, how is that term um, in, your, in your perspective, um, maybe a, a slightly strategic, shift, a strategic shift on the part of Wright uh, at that point in time. Yeah, it, uh, very, 
very insightful of you to pull out that those that well, one quote because it really was a, a kind of a nuanced change in his thinking. Um, but first, I have to say that you know Wright is known for Fauna One and Two, and he does talk about wilderness in there, along with his his colleagues. Um, but they use different terms back then. You know, pristine America, pristine wilderness. Um, pristine was used a lot. And and them trying to define what that was, was uh, an intellectual exercise that took them a while to, to figure out. And of course, they weren't the only ones thinking about wilderness back then. There was a lot of people thinking about wilderness at that time from the turn of the century on, right? Even before. Um, and so they were part of a whole spectrum of people thinking about this. But the traditional way to look at wilderness was a place that was completely undeveloped, right? It's like the classic, you know, roadless area, no mechanized movement within an area. Um, probably one of the biggest proponents of the classic untouched wilderness, which is not really true, um, because we can get back and talk about that in a little bit about the disposition of the displacement of indigenous people um, was Bob Marshall, who was one of the creators and founders of the Wilderness Society in 1935. And um, so even though Wright was known for all of his wildlife work, in incredible wildlife work, one thing I discovered, which was amazing to me, was his, his advocacy for wilderness. I mean, it wasn't really known until I started reading you know, finding some paper. I have a, copies of, of almost all of his presentations. You start looking at the conferences he went to the last couple of years of his life. <clears throat> um, he was almost always focused on 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 um, wilderness in the national parks and beyond. And he and Bob Marshall were good, were good friends. And I think initially he did have he did have that perception of uh, or the thought that you know wilderness or a pristine area was basically what the landscape looked like prior to the arrival of European Americans in the West. Um, but they didn't really know, and they admitted it. They, like they couldn't figure out, like if we were gonna manage to pristine, what is that? But I think he changed his thinking a little bit, even like the, when the Wilderness Society was, was formed in 1935 by Marshall and Leopold and a, a group of other people, uh, Murray, uh, Olas Murray, and others, they had a very strict view of what wilderness was. And it was that, you know, roadless, no mechanized travel, place you have to cross on foot and sleep out overnight. I mean, some really basic things. And they didn't actually appreciate the park service in, in the national parks to a certain degree, to a large degree, because you know, national parks were created for the for use by humans, which which just means logically that you have to build roads, you have to build facilities, um, yeah, right? all all that stuff. You have to have programs within those parks, and so the Park Service actually the directors when they went, uh, you know, Albright and and Kamer in particular when they went to conferences and talked about wilderness or pristine areas, they claimed that. Everything is inside the big Western national parks that wasn't developed was wilderness. So it was kind of, you know, the, not backward thinking, but the parks weren't preserved for wilderness. They were preserved for people to use them. Um, and that everything else was going to be was going to be wilderness. They didn't want to develop all, all of the parks and uh, all of the all of the land within a park. In the park yeah. And and right in 1935 was <clears throat> tagged by. Secretary of the Interior and, and the President to head up uh, a committee um, on the Natural Resources Board, which uh, FDR, after he was elected, created to try to analyze how to better use the country's resources and create better recreation opportunities for people. And his committees uh, that he headed up included people that were you know, from urban areas, urban parks, architects, landscape architects, engineers, and it really changed his view on what wilderness was. And that wilderness had to be almost like a resource or utility for people. So that's why it, it's not being 
you create wilderness, you're not taking it out of use. In fact, you're setting it aside for the future use of generations. And it might seem like semantics, but it was actually somewhat of a shift um, in his thinking. Well, he was trying to sell, uh, market his ideas in the context of the New Deal, in the oh, midst yeah. of, of, a, of a national emergency, the Great Depression. And he was, it strikes me, Jerry, that he was smart enough to realize that um, he, he was speaking to the president's agenda too, and that he could, in fact, um, deliver, deliver what he was trying to do, but turn, use the terminology of the times and make it work to his advantage. And he did because he was able to, you could talk to this, I think it'd be great if you talk to this, is attract enormous resources from the emergency conservation funds that were available to the federal government. Um, that this, this was uh, a moment of massive transition for the National Park Service where it grew leaps and bounds. Um, so uh, Jerry, can you uh, give us some sense, of, uh, right refers or you refer to the term, I think uh, of a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, this ability to work across agencies or work across disciplines enable Wright to, to essentially help a lot of different things to happen, but making sure that wildlife in the national parks were part of that portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely right. Um, correct. And, um, you know, I mentioned that <clears throat> although historically they were antagonistic, the Park Service and the Biological Survey and the, the uh, Forestry Forest Service, um, he was able to bring them together um, with help from all sorts of other folks and do the circumstances. But, you know, he, he, he always had a very hard time with boundaries of national parks because the national parks in the West were created for their iconic features not for wildlife. And so he was coming in after the fact and realizing that the boundaries were artificial. They didn't work for wildlife. And that he had to work with the Forest Service and with the Biological Survey to um, try to expand boundaries to control predator control, stop predator control. I mean, the Biological Survey killed so many animals, it's phenomenal that people don't realize. And um, also work with the Forest Service, which, which wasn't all about extraction. They had conservation areas within the Forest Service. So he was trying to he was trying to work on, you know, ecosystem management on a large scale before it was even a term. Um, and um, after FDR was uh, was elected in, in May of. Uh, was it 33? <laughs> um, 30. well, the election was, uh, I think, no, in 32, but he took office in 33. Right, May of 33. Um, and uh, immediately, you know, the first 100 days created um, um, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was also, uh, by my reading, his favorite program. He was a huge fan of national parks. Um, and so right had a team of maybe three or four. Um, and then all of a sudden, due to the emergency conservation funds, um, you know, by the time he died in 36, he had a staff of 27. He had, he would, had been able to use those emergency conservation funds and hire naturalist rangers and place them within almost all the parks throughout the West. And they were all highly trained. They all knew the Grinnellian note-taking system. Um, they all wrote monthly reports. He encouraged them to publish. Um, and they were there, his, his eyes and ears within all the different parks. Um, and so he was able to use the, the situation um, um, as tough it as it was across the country to expand um, work of wildlife and, and natural resources in the national parks. 
Um, unfortunately, that that tapered off um, after he passed away for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but uh, he also learned that, you know, he was mostly was out in California. But in 34, he was back with his young family at that point in D.C. for an appointment of about nine months and then came back to Berkeley and then moved back to D.C. permanently in 35. And um, uh, he learned that the, you know, during this period, the Civilian Conservation Corps and the engineers and the landscape architects were massively building out the parks and impacting wildlife. And he learned almost by mistake that, um, you know, he oftentimes was asked to sign off on projects when they're almost, they were already shovel ready. And, uh, and so he finally complained to the director and said, no, I need to be in the meetings at the very beginning to be able to say, no, this is bad for wildlife. And, um, and, and he won and he eventually got into, he learned the system. When he got back to DC, you know, almost all of the staff was, were engineers and architects. Um, the, and he was it. He was the wildlife biologist, and Ben Thompson came with him. But eventually, he was able to build out his team, um, and also have more of a say in what was being done inside inside the parks in terms of development. I mean, they also, you know, they the CCC crews would come into a park along a road and clear out all the dead trees. They literally, you know, like our former president with the the rake in the forest. Um, they literally would rake up everything as far as you could see and burn it. They wanted everything nice and clean. And, and the wildlife team was like, no, 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 no. You gotta, you gotta leave the brush. You gotta leave the dead trees for the wildlife, you know? Um, so he had a lot of educating to do. Yeah, this is an issue that um, have been, has bedeviled the National Park Service forever, which is making sure the right people are at the table. And I can, you know, I certainly attest from uh, a cultural resource perspective, you know, the same lament that uh, you end up seeing projects um, after they've already moved to uh, almost to construction and you review it, not not in the formative stages, but, it, you know, a, a after the fact. Um, you know, the other uh, item that uh, is interesting when you talk about the staffing out of um, uh, the wildlife division with emergency funding. I, I think, uh, you know, uh, the same thing was going on with HAB's program, the Historic American Building Survey, their ability to take unemployed architects. Justice Wright was taking uh, essentially unemployed biologists from the universities and putting them in the parks. And he was, he, he was, must have been attuned, uh, keenly attuned to that opportunity. Absolutely. And he, uh, you know, on the, on the, uh, he was on the receiving end in Grinnell at Berkeley uh, for the most part. I mean, he had guys on his staff from other universities and other parts of the country, but Grinnell was just literally pumping out students and um, asking Wright all the time in letters, hey, you know, you have any more, have any more room? Um, and also Wright was going back to Berkeley and, um, and hiring guys before they even finished their degrees. Um, and like Lowell Sumner, you know, he, who was in a PhD program studying underneath Grinnell and Wright offered him a job. And, and later, many years later, Sumner said, how could I, how, how could I give, you know, pass that up? And he just left school and became um, one of the top biologists in the park service for decades. I just have to add, because I'm, I, I have one eye on the chat that uh, uh, John Jarvis, who's on, uh, on this webinar today has added a, um, a, a short uh, comment uh, quote from Sally Jewell, former Secretary of the Interior. If you are not at the table, you are on the menu. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> uh, one last point uh, before we go to, there are a few questions here uh, in the chat, but um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about this relationship with UC Berkeley um, and the importance of this very tight uh, symbiotic 
uh, mutually um, reinforcing relationship between academia and government agencies. I mean, Wright really exemplified the way, I mean, he had his office on the UC Berkeley campus. As uh, I might add, I suppose I, the, the education program for the National Park Service was originally right. based at the university. It was like an adjunct campus for the National Park Service. Um, given, uh, have, have, is there a place for that kind of cooperation today, do you think? I mean, you know, have we, have we lost a little bit of that um, ability to, to tap the best and the brightest from uh, the academic world? Boy, you know, I don't know if I'm really qualified to, to answer that. I mean, I can talk about from a historical perspective, but um, I've been out of, uh, <clears throat> well, I never was in academia, but I've been out of grad school for a very long time. Um, um, so I, I really, I really don't know. I mean, I have been spending a lot of time over at Berkeley doing research and um, talking with some people at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology have been very helpful to me. Um, and um, also Patrick Gonzalez, who's now the new head of the uh, Institute for Parks, People and Biodiversity and others, Steve, Steve Bessinger. And um, um, I, I, I don't think there's the fluid exchange that there used to be. Um, I think, I mean, I, I actually, I, I really don't know. I really don't know. I mean, I, you know, people get government grants, they work, you know, they can, they can have positions within the park service and also be in academia. There's different variations on the theme, but, but back in the day, it really was a one-way street. Um, I mean, Berkeley was, you know, produced not only the first two directors who passed through Berkeley, Mather and, and Albright, um, but Harold Bryant, one of Grinnell's first students, uh, who was an ornithologist, went on to have a huge career in the Park Service and became Wright's boss. Um, and there's literally dozens, dozens of names that um, I've put together of people that went mostly through the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, but also forestry, um, just like Wright. Um, the first head of the education, uh, Ansel Hall, was a, a forester from Berkeley. And they were all situated in Hillgard Hall because Mulford Hall was not built until 1948. Um, and in fact, uh, my wife and I were just over there with Patrick Gonzalez looking at the Wright's two offices, which are now big, huge open lab spaces um, because he <clears throat> at one point, you know, had maybe a dozen guys or 10 guys working for him in those, in those offices, plus a huge library he'd accumulated. Um, and they're going to put up plaques over there uh, at Berkeley to to uh, to recognize that appropriately. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. You know, we've got a question from uh, our friend uh, Bob Krimenacher, um, um, who wrote in Jerry that he wanted to um, thank you for mentioning the relationship between George Wright and Bob Marshall, but he uh, that they were friends and collaborators. And, and, and uh, Bob said he, he hadn't realized that, um, but he had long been wondering whether George Wright had a relationship with Aldo Leopold. Can you speak to that? Well, I don't have any specific proof of correspondence um, uh, and nothing is as crystal clear as I have between uh, Bob Marshall and, and Wright. But I do know that they attended a lot of the same conferences. Um, Aldo Leopold was uh, older than George Wright. Um, and um, they wrote a lot about wilderness from different perspectives a little bit. Um, it's my reading that Leopold wasn't a huge, huge fan of national parks. After all, he came from the forestry side, correct? And um, even, even early on when they were talking about wilderness areas, he early on, he actually thought that some extractive uses, if, if done properly, were probably okay. Um, but I, I think uh, I think that Wright certainly read everything um, that Leopold wrote at the time. Uh, during the, like from 30 on, there was a whole spate of important articles that were written about uh, wilderness. And then later on, they, like I say, in 34, 35, and early 36, they attended a lot of the same conferences. So I'm sure there was some interaction. Um, but when FDR, uh, FDR created a, uh, 
a committee for uh, wildlife restoration um, in 1934, and he put on that on that commission a guy named um, Beck, who was an old friend of uh, Roosevelt's, who was the head editor of Collier's Magazine, Aldo Leopold, <clears throat> who I think maybe had just written a, a book on uh, North American game birds and maybe had just started his professorship. And then um, Jay Norwood Ding Darling, who was a who was a uh, cartoonist, but a huge conservationist and hunter. Beck was a big hunter and Leopold was a big hunter. And he appointed them to this high profile wildlife commission and they, they produced this report. And, um, but it was mostly about uh, trying, to, trying to restore wetlands and uh, upland game habitat for birds, really. And Wright, um, at, the, at one point, wrote the director and all the top brass when, the, when that wildlife report came out um, from that committee and said, it's a good thing um, they're finally catching up with what we're doing. Basically, he said it more diplomatically, but he had already printed fauna number one, where where everything was already covered, um, and so he just wanted the director to be reminded that the Park Service was in the lead on this subject, and uh, he was looking forward to continuing to be in the lead. It's interesting how he how he used the fauna books not just as inventories, but in fact as guidelines and really policy markers for the service. It's true. And you know, the, the recommendations at the very end of FAUNA number one, I believe there's, there are 20, um, were officially adopted by the Park Service, but not on the ground in some of the parks because of the old school superintendents, old school rangers. And so once again, getting back to his communication skills, he actually, as I write about in the book, um, came up with a, a communication plan working with the director um, to remind each superintendent individually that this was now a policy and you, you're not to shoot predators anymore um, and you're not to do all these other things. And, um, and uh, but it, it took some lobbying. But that also gets back to, you know, the, all the early employees of uh, the Park Service, the, including the superintendents before they came out of the service, you know, they were, they were not trained. They're sometimes local, local guys. All the rangers were local guys. Um, and it was way before, you know, women had came into the service. And uh, towards the end of Mather's career in life, and then Albright's, he was slowly trying to professionalize the service um, and, and, and made pretty good strides. You have a question, Jerry, from uh, Mike Walton from the Yukon. And Mike asks, uh, did you find any connection um, between Wright and um, his influence or any influence with Canada's national park system? Well, he did spend time in Alaska bypassing Canada, um, but he did also visit um, Waterton Glacier. International Park, because that was already created. Um, maybe someone can remind me when that was created, but probably late 20s, early 30s, maybe. Sounds right. Um, and and it made a big impact on him because he loved the the concept of an international park that you know didn't that disregarded borders, even though there were management issues with that border. Um, and so he did he did venture into just that one part of Canada. Um, but the, the creation of that park did make an impact on him. And then of course, at the very end of his life, when he was in Big Ben, where Bob is, um, uh, and he was on that international commission with his Mexican colleagues to look at an international park down there, he referenced in his notes and writing Waterton Glacier um, as an example of, of how it could be done. Because when they went on that, that expedition for about five or six days, they were just crisscrossing the border as if it didn't forth. exist, except that they had to ford the ford the Rio Grande about you know ten times, and their cars kept on getting swept away and flooded, and yeah, it's a it was a good story, yeah. Um, 
We have a question from uh, Dave Parsons. Uh, uh, you know, did Dave, George Wright ever express any opinions on Native Americans in the national parks? He did. He did. And um, this gets, it's a huge subject, but, um, you know, in, in 19, July of 1929, before he had actually officially started the wildlife survey, um, he was back and he was in Yellowstone, uh, Yosemite, where he had been a ranger for two years. And um, because he spoke Spanish, George Wright was bilingual as well as his brothers. Um, he had the opportunity to spend the day with uh, Maria Labrada, Labrada, who also known as Totuya, who was one of the last Indians in the valley uh, before the uh, you know white settlers came in and um, ran them out in about 1851, trying to clear the area for gold prospecting. And um, she, the first time she had returned to the valley in, in 80 years, and she spoke Spanish because she had married a Mexican-American. So he was her guide for the day. And I maintain that that, that experience showed to Wright that these so-called pristine landscapes that had been set aside as national parks were in fact, obviously, previously inhabited for generations by indigenous people. And the only time he, he really dives into that subject is when he's talking about Glacier National Park and the, he wanted to reintroduce uh, Buffalo to the Eastern side of Glacier. And of course, Glacier had been historically all um, but Blackfeet Indian um, land traditionally. And you know, the line up the east side of Glacier is pretty artificial. It's basically a straight line up and down. And he wanted to introduce Buffalo because it would benefit the Blackfeet and it would, uh, it would benefit the park because they would spend the summers in the park in the higher elevations. And then as they used to do, go down to the lower lands into the reservation uh, to be managed by the Indians there. And his basic point was where you think there might be two different perspectives on this issue with Buffalo. In fact, it's really, it can be considered as, as one, one effort because it would benefit the park service and it would benefit the people in the reservation culturally and historically who used to have the animals there. They, they were so important to them. At the time, the, the idea didn't uh, gain any momentum. He, he thought the the, the elders on the reservation were still pretty dubious of the, the government, and rightly so at the time. But since then, um, you know, they have reintroduced buffalo onto the res on the reservation. Um, but he was he was struck because when he was up in Glacier, he he came across someone that had been working on a trail pretty high up on the east side, and they came across a a, a, sc a skull of a of a buffalo, and he thought, oh, well, that makes sense. I mean, they they used to be here. But they had all been wiped out. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he was already talking about what today, you know, can be considered co-management of natural resources and in 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 wildlands and park areas between, um, you know, a state or federal agency and the local uh, indigenous people who have historic knowledge, traditional knowledge of the resources there. Um, you know, he didn't write it out and say it out as fully as that, but I think he was getting there. Uh, one more, uh, there was a follow-up uh, question and we're, we're, we may take this as the last one or we're getting close at least, um, uh, from Bob in Big Bend. And he, first of all, he thanked, thank, wants to thank you for the shout out <laughs> regarding Big Bend and George Wright. Uh, and he did want the group uh, on this call to know that there is a, uh, an organization that's been set up called keepbigbenwild.org that is uh, reviving a long dormant wilderness recommendation for most of Big Ben and a possibility of uh, at some point in the future of naming it uh, the George Melendez Wright Wilderness. Uh, and this group is working closely with the national parks. Correct. Thank you. And, and um, I've, been in, I've been in touch with them and um, and Bob helped with this project. Uh, thank you, Bob. And of course, in 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 Big Bend, there's a 
uh, uh, Toll Mountain and Wright Mountain. They might be Mount Wright and Mount Toll. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, in honor of Roger Toll and George Wright, who who died uh, after in a car wreck after visiting that park in February of 1936. And Bob also, I worked with him a little bit. Um, Bob also just installed a really beautiful um, uh, in installation that actually looking right at uh, Mount Wright, um, interpretive panel uh, about George Wright and his time in Big Ben and with some beautiful photos, um, which I helped him with. Um, and it's a really nice uh, uh, pull off, you know, in, in the park to, to find out a little bit more about George Wright. Uh, Frank uh, Prisoner uh, uh, mentions uh, or, or asks a little bit about the possibility of somewhere having um, a kind of a museum or exhibit on Wright's contributions and all the projects he worked on. But that sounds a Big Ben wouldn't be a bad location for, um, you know, maybe this is uh, this interpretive wayside is uh, a good uh, representation, but you know big maybe big bend is a good site for something like that could be or you know i'm sure Ber berkeley would lo lobby a little bit to have something over there um and um yeah i mean it's a good idea of course a lot of it can be done online and, and virtually and hopefully the book will will spur people on to to learn more about him where he worked um how we impacted people how we supported women um you know how we thought so um, uh, progressively about uh, resources and, and indigenous uh, people. And um, there was a lot of a lot of interesting ideas percolating in that guy's brain that he he did get out, uh, but, but some that I think were just cut short because his life was cut short. Berkeley would be an excellent uh, venue for that, I have to say, um, particularly since, you know, I mean, They've, they've occupied his old office, but you know the potential exists at some point in the future to have something there. Um, it would be uh, uh, something I'm sure the university would be hugely proud of uh, and should be at least. Yeah, and I think that uh, I think there are some wheels turning over there about that. Um, not only at Hillgard Hall, but also at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. Um, so we'll see, and I'm, I'm here to help them out if they need any help. Uh, one last question. Um, given, uh, you know, right throughout his, his career uh, was a go-to guy. I mean, he was a hands-on kind of, with any issue. He, he went to the place. He, he wanted to see it firsthand. And in those days, transportation wasn't easy. He had to take trains or um, you know, in some cases had to have his car towed across the Rio Grande by horses. Um, but he got around and, and his team got around. Um, I was just curious, uh, Jerry, in this day and age, um, when we're dealing in, you know, where so much of interaction is relegated to formats like this, you know, and they have certain advantages, but they also don't get you up close and personal with what you're looking at, what you're talking about. Um, but also given uh, highly constrained agency travel budgets, uh, are we losing something you think of, I mean, there's something about rights, energy about getting out and seeing and meeting people. In fact, it's those relationships that uh, really bore fruit mm -hmm. uh, for his program. Well, I think it obviously was a very different time. Um, I'm reminded of a conversation I had with a professor emeritus at Berkeley who um, still does field work um, every year, goes out to probably the same site he's been working for I don't know how long. Um, and because um, I asked him basically this, this question, a form of this question. And he said that um, there's definitely not as much field work nowadays that sometimes when he tries to invite students to go out with them, they don't go. <laughs> and, and he's a great guy and fun to be around. Um, but he said an awful lot of the analysis nowadays is based on museum specimens and at the DNA level. And there's a lot of lab work compared to, you know, Wright was out there just learning the basics. Like what, what is out here? 
like what is in this park and what is surrounding this park and what are the issues like the big big questions so it's not as though all those questions have been answered so they don't need to get back out there they still do um I think people are also just you know have adapted technology I mean you look at uh um, there's a, a, some ornithologists around my house who have been studying uh, spotted owls and the way they go about their work is, uh, you know, both basic field work and, and high tech. And I think that that's probably the, the difference nowadays, but I don't think there's as much field work, but again, you know, what do I know? I, last time I, you know, was in school at Berkeley was in 1984 or something. So, yeah. Well, Jerry, Jerry, this has been a wonderful opportunity to, and thank you so much for taking uh, the time to, uh, to do this today, to do this webinar. And um, thank you for writing this book. You bet. You bet. It's my extreme pleasure. And I want to thank everyone that, that tuned in. Um, and um, feel free to contact me if you have any additional questions. I mean, there's a lot more. I could keep talking, but we can't go any farther. <laughs> I'll turn it over to Dave at this point. Yeah, no, I want thank to you thank you very much, Rolf. Yeah, I, and I want to thank you too, Rolf, for your insightful moderation. That really added a lot to our hour. Jerry, I add my congratulations. Uh, I also agree with Rolf's characterization. This is a landmark book, and uh, uh, it's it's a wonderful read too. So I obviously urge everybody who's listening uh, and watching to to get it. And just before I sign off, I I I can't. Uh, I can't resist. I have to. I have to recognize a very special attendee who's here with us today, and that's Pamela Melendez Wright Lloyd, you know George Wright's daughter. Um, and Pam, uh, you know, I just, uh, I just first of all, I want to thank you and everybody in the Lloyd family, but especially you for keeping the memory of your father so vividly alive during all those years, and uh, you know, having it culminate, I think, in this book, and it, it just gives me more pleasure than I can even state to know that you're uh, enjoying this accomplishment of Jerry uh, with the support of, you know, which he accomplished with the support of the whole family. And uh, so, Pam, warmest greetings to you uh, and uh, continue to enjoy the, the afterglow of this wonderful accomplishment. <laughs> and so, so anyway, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, as I mentioned at the top of the chat, this is uh, being recorded, and we will post it to the George Wright Society YouTube channel. Everybody who registered will get a notice, so you can relive the magic uh, as many times as you want, or let your friends know about the uh, about the webinar too. So, yeah. thank you all uh, again, Rolf, Jerry. Thanks so much, and uh, y'all have a good day. And we'll see you at the next uh, next George Wright webinar. Take care, everybody. Bye bye.